All right, welcome to the first lesson in our World War II unit. Although, on the notes, this is actually part of the first part that says the interwars period. We're going to be having the next few lessons on all the things that are happening in between the world wars because they're absolutely, absolutely necessary to understand. Um, they're absolutely necessary to understand going into this all uh, and, and to understand World War II. Now, if you have not uh, listened to the very last lesson on uh, the end of World War One, you it's you need to you need to know those stuff like the results of World War One. You need to know to understand the things we're going to be talking about here. Now, another thing, I have redone this PowerPoint so it flows better, and I've added in a little bit more information. Unfortunately, the first page on your note packet that you maybe downloaded or even printed off at this point, that very first page will not sync well with this one. I have not fixed that yet. So I would actually suggest uh, getting out a whole new sheet for that very first page or just kind of ignoring the flow on that first page as you're taking notes here because there's a bit more to put in there than what it looks like you need to. And again, it does not flow the same way. So just a bit of warning getting into this. Now, if you notice from what this is saying, it says, Rise of Dict Dictators, the Era of Totalitarianism. I'm not going to go into much of an explanation just now because... All the slides in the in a bit they'll actually explain and give definitions to what totalitarianism is and just why these dictators come about but it actually in some ways is a little bit simple this this is simple but it's going to take a bit of explanation to get into now the end of world war one uh the world is in just complete despair uh and uh, you know everybody's affected by this uh, uh, beyond Europe is affected by this, and in some, in just very, very, how would I put it, just heart-wrenching ways, of course, families torn apart, uh, meaning like lots of loved ones are dead, uh, and on all sides, uh, if you did not experience the idea of losing loved ones, that you're definitely, most definitely, unless you're living in the United States or Japan, you're definitely experiencing a massive economic collapse that has led to huge social tension. Uh, like the despair, the pessimism, the, the lack of hope is so pervasive that, uh, you know, understandably, people start questioning the existence of God. Uh, you know, uh, is there really anything out there to offer any hope? Is that, is, that, is that hope or belief in something greater than yourself just all a facade? Um, uh, and with this kind of thinking, as it says down, the, down there at the bottom, you know, people start looking to new things, trying to get uh, something just to come in and just fix things. Just please make my life better. Please allow me to be happy again is kind of the sentiment. So you get new ideas, people look to new ideas and new leaders that they never would have looked to before uh, this despair that World War I brought about uh, in order to just make life better. Thus, it leads to an era, era where we see the rise of dictators and totalitarian states. Now, those are not separate. Dictators lead totalitarian states. Anyways. What are these new ideas? First one. Yes, we're getting into this. I'm. I don't know if that's very well. Hopefully, you can read that all right. If not, I'm going to switch this up a little. Oh, wrong one again. Let's see if I can. Okay. Hopefully, that's easier to read for you on your on your screen. If you're on a phone, that's going to be tough. That'd be this will be better to do on a computer. But I'm trying to explain as best as possible what these new ideas are. I'm pretty positive you've heard of this idea before socialism. Uh, but I wonder if you really have an understanding of it. In fact, there's so many different definitions out there and there's so many different understandings of people, what people think of it. It is actually highly argued about what socialism is, but there is just a short and simple of it. Uh, the short and simple of socialism is everybody uh, shares everything. That's the best way I can put it. Now, if you're looking at the definitions there, I pulled us off of Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, mainly because that's considered a, a reliable source, although yeah, I can make arguments with some of the things here. But I do underline some major points. Uh, and that first point, collective or governmental ownership, meaning that if everybody's going to own everything, then society, the as a collective, must own everything. 
Uh, if everybody owns everything, then there's no need and there should never be any idea of private property. And then again, if everybody owns everything or everybody's supposed to share everything, then of course the means of production uh, are controlled by the state, meaning society and whoever's in charge of society uh, decides who does what and how much of that needs to be done. You know, you can't decide, I really want to make this because I want to sell it. Uh, the state would have to say, you need to make this because you need to give it to everybody else. That's the simple way to put it. Now, if you notice that symbol there next to socialism, uh, one of the universal uh, symbols of socialism is the raised fist. Now, that being, uh, that being put in place, or that being said about socialism is communism. Communism is very similar. In fact, the guy who came up with the word socialism also came up with the word communism. Or the two guys, actually, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. Um, in fact, the idea was is that you had to live a socialistic style life first before you could enjoy the utopian idea of what communism is. So as far as I'm going to go into it on that one, uh, the odd part is is that uh, socialists and communists 100 years ago, you know, even leading into World War II, and today actually argue a bit, you know, saying, well, communism is better than socialism, even though they share the same ideas. Just look at the definitions there and it's pretty much saying the same thing, just in a little bit different way. In fact, one of the main ideas that go that is attributed to communism, but is also said about socialism all the time, is take from those that have, and give to those that have not. Or as you see there from the Merriam-Webster dictionary thing, goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed. Meaning that, well, if you have a lot, that's not really yours you have to share with those that are in need of those same things you have. If you have two cars and you only really need one of them to do your job, then you must give that car to a family that maybe needs it. You don't have a choice in that matter. Um, notice it also talks about the emanation of private property. Um, and then a single authoritarian party controls state-owned means of production. That is something that's added in a little bit later because that's usually what we see in communistic or socialistic states. One political party controlling everything. Good example today, China. Uh, the one political party in charge of China, and there are no others to challenge it, is the Communistic Party of China. They run everything. You're either a member of the party or you don't, you don't have a say in anything. So, um, anyways, uh, but looking back again to the basic ideas of both socialism and communism, the idea is, is that everybody owns everything. The state or the government essentially has to divvy out who gets what type thing, uh, what is fair. So, now, if you're living in a world of despair, if you're living in just this complete pessimistic view of things. You want someone to make things something better, something better. Someone comes along and, and shares these ideas with you saying your life can be better if people would just share more. That makes sense. You know, if you're in a situation where despair is all there, then that makes sense. Uh, I shouldn't say makes sense, but it definitely gives you hope. Well, it does make sense and gives you hope depending on where you're looking, but sorry, I'm not going to get, try not to get too much into the, the weeds on this one. Now, the third idea that comes about is an idea called fascism. Now, fascism, according to Benito Mussolini, the first guy ever to use fascism, although he technically doesn't come up with it, he gets his ideas from others, uh, philosophers of the 1800s. Again, I'm not going to go into that too much. But here's how he states it. Everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state essentially meaning the state is everything. Your country is everything. Um, um, I put the Merriam-Webster dictionary uh, definition there because they say something there that is actually very good. Exalts nation and often race, doesn't mean it has to be about race, but we have seen almost all the fascistic uh, states over the last hundred years have usually brought racism into it. So this again though, exalts nation and often race above the individual, meaning that I am not important when it comes to the state, 
if the government or the state says that I need to do this and I don't want to because I don't want to, then the state will just get rid of me, you could say. Uh, I am not contributing to the state the way I should do. I'm not doing my nationalistic duty to the state. That's the best way I can basically explain fascism. Now, oddly enough, fascists are have always, always been against communists and socialists. The funny thing is, is that all three of these ideas share uh, a major similarity. And that similarity is this, and please write this in your notes. Socialism, communism, and fascism all say that the greater good and the group as a whole is more important than the individual. You can see that when you see things like socialism, communism, talking about uh, there is no private property or you need to eliminate private property, meaning that what I own as an individual is not important. I can't have that. That is evil. And fascism pretty much comes out and says, no, as an individual, you do not matter. It is the state that matters. All three of them agree on that. Essentially, what is the the whole, the group, the, the, the group as a whole is more important than you as an individual. Now, really quickly, I need to just interject a little bit with American style thinking. Um, all three of these go against uh, what the United States is built on. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, protection of individual rights and individual liberties, uh, individual happiness and in what you want to do with your life. Our idea of Americanism is in direct contradiction of all three of these things. All three of those might have little differences in between them, and yes, there's more of a difference between fascism and then the other two, you could argue, but they are still, all three of them say that the group is more important than the individual, and then there's no place for individual liberties that does not fly in American society, hence why uh, the terms fascism, communism, socialism have had very negative uh, uh, connotations in our society. Although that is starting to change a little bit with socialism, at least. Um, anyways, not going to go down that road anymore because we are trying to keep this in going into just before World War II. But these are new ideas where people are thinking, my life will be better if we can just follow that. If everybody can just go along with that, our lives will get better. Now, those are the ideas. Who comes up with the, these ideas? Well, here you go. Now, first off, I'm going to name the guys that come up with it. Notice how you see the terms, the ideas next to them, like Benito Mussolini, fascistic Italy. Joseph Stalin, communistic Soviet Union. Adolf Hitler, National Socialist Germany. The funny thing there is the national part of that is a bit on the fascist, like that's a bit fascistic to say the national, but socialist is just straight up socialism. What it's saying there is that Hitler actually took both socialism and fascism and put them together. Uh, he just called it National Socialism. Uh, Francisco Franco, fascist. And Hideko Cho uh, Hideki Tojo, or uh, the military dictator of Japan, that's officially what it is. Uh, but uh, if you compared it to what we just talked about with the ideas, uh, Japan was quite fascistic uh, leading into World War II. Now, all of those areas, whether it's Italy, Soviet Union, uh, Germany, Spain, and Japan, we consider these to be totalitarian states. And you see a definition of totalitarian state up there. A system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete subservience to the state. If you notice, the ideas we talked about, socialism, communism, and fascism, all lead towards that idea. If you do not have individual liberties, then of course your liberties are sucked up into subservience to the state. You do not matter as an individual. What matters most is uh, the good of everyone. The problem there is, is who decides what is good for everybody? And that is where dictators come in. Mussolini decided what was good for everybody in Italy. Uh, Lenin and then Stalin after him decided what was good for everybody in the Soviet Union. Franco decided what was good for everybody in uh, Spain. Tojo decided what was good for everybody in uh, Japan. And nobody else really had a say. And if you didn't belong to their political party, of course, and there's really only one political par party allowed, these guys, all these guys up here did a great job of getting rid of all political opposition. 
In fact, uh, that's the reason for concentration camps in Germany, by the way. Hitler put all, uh, all political enemies into concentration camps. We usually think of concentration camps and the idea of the Holocaust. That's not how they started. That's just what they turned into, into those death camps. They actually started as a way of getting rid of political enemies, getting them out of the public eye. Anyways, hopefully I'm explaining this well enough, but that's where we're at right now. People are in just a mass of hope and despair. These guys come along and say, I'll make life better. And people are like, what else do we have to lose? Let's, let's give it a whirl. So <clears throat> by the way, that's just my basic general sum up of that whole thing. Of course, there's a lot of, in, uh, there's a lot of stories and events that go into all of that, but that's basically how it goes if I'm trying to explain it as simple as possible. Now, simply put, how did this work in each in uh, each nation? In Italy, how did how did it go fascist? How did the, this work? Well, at first, like we talked about the end of World War I, Italy feels very underappreciated and betrayed. They didn't get their empire. They they threw in all this uh, they lost so many people and the Caporate Offensive was so disastrous, yet they felt like they really got nothing out of it. And then it felt like the, everything, the economy was going downhill. Well, it was. The, the, the depression, the 1920s was going on them. So they're like, okay, let's, let's please do something to get this, uh, get this going again. By the way, one of the things that was like the visual of this all was the fact that the trains never ran on time. In comes Mussolini with, this is actually, this is 19, oh God, I'm losing my, years, 1920 or 1922, or somewhere in between, right after World War I, Mussolini comes in, uh, usurps authority, does a coup against the king, gets rid of the king, and puts himself in as what's called il duce, or the leader. So I have that nice picture there at the bottom of him. And he institutes fascism. Now, this is where I'd like to talk about where the term fascism even comes from. This idea that the state is all important, and everybody has to sacrifice to the state, as I say again there, I I actually feel like I do a better job of explaining what fascism is there than, say, Merriam-Webster does, but there you go. If you're looking at that symbol there, that axe with the gigantic handle, really what it is is that's actually a symbol from the Roman Empire. It's uh, a handle with a bunch of different um, axe handles on it, and the idea is that, you know, one axe with one handle on it, because if you notice, there's one little handle in the axe, Maybe that is made out of the strongest stuff ever, but if you keep using it over and over again, that handle will probably break at some point. But if you wrap all the handles up and attach it to the axe, it'll never break. You know, it's, just, it's a symbol of essentially teamwork. You know, we're a team. We're, we're all Italians. We're all in this together. You know, if we can just come together and do everything for the benefit of the state, this will be great. But of course, you can't have any weak handles in there. So if you view it as a weak handle, you don't belong. You need to be gotten rid of. You need to be oppressed and destroyed because there's no, you can't have anybody that's not with it, not in there putting the state first. But if you think about it, it's like all of us, fascism, the idea of like taking all of us citizens, wrapping us up and saying we are all working together. Problem is, is that then who decides what, what goals we're working towards? So you need to have a dictatorial hand guiding that ax and where it's going to fall, what it's going to do, what it's going to be the national purpose of the country. And that's what Mussolini does. He becomes the hand that guides the axe, and he gets rid of anybody uh, that disagrees with him, essentially as a weak handle in the axe. I'm hoping and doing an all right job explaining this, but this is the beginning of fascism uh, as a world uh, philosophy, ideology, and thought. It starts with Mussolini in Italy, even on he, although he does get his ideas from some from other people before him, but he's the first guy to really put it in practice. Now, moving on to Russia. We talked about Russia a bit in, uh, in, our world, in World War I, so I'm not going to rehash a lot of that. Just know that uh, and after losing millions of people in the World War I and then losing millions of people in the Civil War that we already talked about, a famine hits, and you lose millions of more people in a famine. It just, it's awful to be Russian. It actually... Um, this famine that comes about really did a lot for people. Like everybody in Russia was like, this all sucks, this all sucks, this all sucks, this all sucks. And amidst all this crisis, amidst all this going on, Lenin actually dies. The guy they're looking to, to, to make everything good and do everything the way it needs to be done, to institute communism the way it should be, he dies. And the two, and the two guys flanking him, the guy on his, well, his left, I guess, the way you're looking at the guy on the right, 
is Leon Trotsky. The guy on the left is Joseph Stalin. Essentially, they argued about what was going to happen. And this is where, if you remember me saying this in the World War One PowerPoint about the Russian Revolution, like the, all three of these guys are scary. The funny thing is, is that the Russians decided to go with Stalin because they viewed him as less scary than Trotsky. Now, this is my personal opinion. I view Stalin as, like, he's top of the list of worst person of all time. I mean, that's sixes when you compare that to him and other terrible people, Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, and other people who have been in world history and caused so much death to happen. Uh, you know, uh, Gaul, uh, Genghis Khan, just a bunch of other people who just caused tons of death. But the simple idea was this. Trotsky's idea was, we're not done yet. We need to spread revolution to around all the world. We need to see, we need to cause revolutions in everywhere in the world immediately now. Stalin was kind of more of a little bit, this is weird to say, a little bit more of a, a cautious voice by saying, no, we need to make sure the Soviet Union proves to be a good example, and then we can spread revolution to the rest of the world. So between those two ways of thinking, the Russian people were like, okay, we'll choose Stalin. We'll, we'll go with him, and because Stalin basically does a power grab, and because he realizes you can't have anybody against you politically, you know, one party rule, like communism says, uh, he exiles Trotsky, or Trotsky, I think self-exiles him, if I remember right. Uh, Stalin actually sends assassins after him, and finally they finally catch up to him. That picture you see in the very bottom right is Trotsky in a Mexican hospital. That's where the assassins finally caught up to him, where they'd put a hatchet in the back of his head. And that's where they'd removed it, although even with that surgery, it still didn't work. He still dies. Uh, uh, he dies that same day that photo is, is taken of him that you're seeing there. So... Anyways, those are the problems and just this, all this crazy stuff going on in Russia at this point. This is the 1920s we're talking about, not even the 1930s yet. Germany, they have major problems. Now, in Germany, the losers, the main loser of World War I, they are forced to adopt a government called the Weimar Republic. You have to become democratic. You know, you'll be a such happier nation if you do so because, you know, Britain and France know so much better than you do. But the people of Germany saw the Weimar Republic as a symbol of shame and defeat. Like, you're not our real government, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you're not my real dad type thing. You know, it's kind of the sentiment going in there. And so, what makes it even worse for my republic is their number one duty was to pay back Britain and France. Again, we talked about this at the end of World War I. Um, but their answer to do this was print tons of money. This causes massive hyperinflation. If you do not understand what's going on in that picture off to the right-hand side yet, those are children playing with stacks of money of German marks. They are worthless. You use them to start fires, play with his toys, because they are worthless. They printed so much money, it literally made money worthless. Um, uh, thus making the Depression in Germany that much more worse than anywhere else in the world in the early 1920s. Notice how I keep saying the Depression in the 1920s, not the 1930s. I will be getting that into a little bit. Because um, remember, the American Depression is the 1930s. So, amidst all of this, massive depression, with well, the hyperinflation goes with it, this pessimism, despair, the hatred of your government, well, people want change. So, of course, they get their change. And the guy who gives them their change is Adolf Hitler. Now, notice the year is 1929. I do need to say this. Adolf Hitler does, doesn't really take power until the early 1930s. I think it's 1933. He's actually voted into power. Um, but yeah, it's his party, the Nazi party, that starts giving people hope. And I'll be uh, putting a video on that you can watch if you'd like to. Uh, and uh, talking about all this as well, that uh, sheds a bit more light on it for you. But essentially... The Nazis, National Socialism, you know, people start thinking he can do it. Maybe he's the guy that's going to fix Germany. And the thing is, is he actually does. Now, before I get into that, let's talk about what he essentially, his main goal is and what he promises the German people, why they put so much hope into him. His main goal is to create a new order that would lead Germany to greatness. Uh, and when we say lead Germany to greatness, we're talking about in every way, shape, and form. Germany would be the number one country in the world. Um, Germany would be the leader in everything, in economics, in, uh, in culture, 
uh, in science and everything like that. Um, uh, and definitely within the idea of ethnicity, too. Um, so, he pro in order to do this, he promises to restore the German economy and provide job security to do, uh, and provide German job security. He does this. He takes an unemployment that was nearly 50% unemployment. By the way, the United States never gets higher than 33% in our Great Depression, but he takes it, uh, an unemployment rate of nearly 50% in Germany and reduces it down to, I can't remember how low it goes, it's like 1 or 2%. It was literally a miracle. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I probably should have found this and put it on this PowerPoint. Dang it. Uh, Time Magazine here in the United States names him Man of the Year for doing that. Uh, and, and he does this using this concept of National Socialism. Like, he even gets the idea where everybody has a job, and he also gives everybody money to send them on vacation, saying, Hey, here's a check in the mail. You can take a two-week vacation down to the French Riviera. Here. Here you go, for the government, uh, from the government, basically. So, the next thing you promise to do is say, we're going to make Germany a pure place. We are all going to be perfect German human beings. Uh, this is what's called eugenics, by the way, purifying the human gene pool. Uh, you know, is racism embedded into this? Most definitely, because you need to get rid of anyone who is considered racially and physically inferior. By the way, Jews are the main target of this, but it's not just them, as I say there. Gypsies, Slavic peoples. By the way, Gypsies are being uh, being rebranded, I guess you get, I shouldn't say rebranded, bad way to put it in, but another term is being used for them today. It's not seen as so much a racial slur as the Roma. But Slavic peoples, mentally unstable, are hereditary ill, homosexual, and disabled, or just too old to do anything. These people do not belong in society anymore. Uh, by the way, that picture you're seeing off to the, the middle right there where they're measuring the guy's head, they try to come up with ways to see, you know, what would a perfect head be like? And anybody that doesn't have this shape of head, you know, a good German head, well, you must be Jewish or something. You must be Roma. You must be Slavic. And therefore, dispensable. Must be gotten rid of. The propaganda poster you see to the left is this idea that, hey, Germany would be so much better off if we could just get rid of these people. Just get rid of them and we'll be a lot better off. And then you also see propaganda posters up top, and this whole idea of like what the perfect uh, family is, and this is where we get the term Aryan. I, uh, I'm not going to tangent off the idea of where Aryan comes from. Just, just know that Hitler was a, a student of history, and he got, got that idea from actually a different society in the world, actually India. But again, I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay, next up, he promises to ignore the humiliating Treaty of Versailles that brought about the Weimar Republic and just brought so much shame to Germany. And he does this, and the re what he does to go against the Treaty of Versailles builds up the military. So there's actually more promises he came up with, but they really, almost all of them fall into those three categories that I, that I have up there, the idea of uh, restore the economy, uh, make uh, Germany racially pure and uh, get rid of the Treaty of Versailles and, and don't have that, that, that ball and chain essentially on you anymore. And Hitler makes good on all of his promises and the people love him for it, absolutely love him for it. Yes, there are some people that don't like them or don't like him. And there's a lot of people that don't like the Nazis in general, but people that didn't like the Nazis still liked Hitler, oddly enough. So... We talk about Hitler today as one of the worst person, if the not if the not the worst person ever to live in human history. So, from our point of view today, where I was thinking like, why would anybody follow this guy? Hopefully, I've explained well enough now why people were so enamored by him. So, there's Italy, Russia, and Germany for you. Now, in all three of these cases, they realize if we're going to get what we want to enforce what we want to suppress those that we don't agree with, we have to have big militaries. Just talked about Germany building a military. There's more pictures of it. The idea that he even goes against the Treaty of Versailles and starts building tanks and half-tracks and airplanes and battleships and stuff like that. But Italy also militarizes. So does the Soviet Union. All these pictures are kind of going along with this idea. What does the rest of the world do along with this? You know, this is one of the causes of World War I, militarization. Britain and France and it's basically just twiddle their thumbs. And the United States, because we go back to being isolation, is just like, not our problem. So, anyways... Now, 
what's the catalyst that really brings things down and really puts guys like Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin to the forefront? It's the Great World Depression of the 1930s. So there's actually two world depressions. One in the 1920s, brought about by World War I, a depression that the United States is not involved in. We actually do very well. Then there's the Great Depression of the 1930s that we do belong to. And essentially, just to explain this very quickly, this is the last slide, by the way, the entire world goes in this massive depression. But because the United States is doing so well, the world invests into the United States, into our stock market, essentially, to buoy themselves up and get back out of their, their own depressions. By the late 1920s, by 1927, 1928, 1929, it is viewed that most of the world has come out of it. France seems like they're doing okay again. Britain is feeling a little bit okay, economically speaking. Even Germany, this is when the Weimar Republic is in there. Hitler's not in there yet. Germany's feeling like things are actually doing all right, uh, finally again. Uh, and then when the United States, through our own real, again, you learn about this in U.S. history, but through our own stupidity, essentially, at all levels, uh, we sink ourselves into the great, our Great Depression we don't just sink ourselves in the Great Depression. We pull the entire world down with us. Um, you know, even the Soviet Union felt this a bit, as much as they were trying not to. That's what I say down at the bottom. In short, the American Great Depression jacked up every other country in the world, too. And this made it much easier for people to say, that's it. We just got to do what Hitler tells us to. We just need to do what Tojo tells us to do. We just need to do... Uh, and what Mussolini and Stalin tells her, they, they can show us the way. They have ways to get out of this because obviously the old ways of doing things just aren't working any longer. Um, and that gave a lot more credence to the ideas of socialism, communism, and fascism in the governments, in the, the Nazi government of Germany and in the fascist government of uh, Italy, the communist government of the Soviet Union and other places. So... I hope I've explained this well, but this is a major catalyst into why World War II starts, is this great world depression and these dictators that feel like I'm going to have it my way. Anyways, I'll see you in the next lesson.